Hi, Charlotte. So I'm talking to Charlotte Tomic today. Um, we're kind of be talking about her work as a public relations uh, guru, I, I suppose I can call you, but also about her parents uh, and herself, uh, the Holocaust survivors, and her own uh, experience afterwards as growing up as as a second generation. Um, Holocaust uh, survivor as such. So if you want to start off, Charlotte, just give us a brief sure. overview, what you are, who you are. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, thank you very much for reaching out, Dirk. You're um, welcome. I am someone who uh, was born actually in Paris, France. My parents went there after the war, after they and my brother and I were born there in Paris. And uh, my uncle uh, was in the French resistance and uh, was hiding out in Paris throughout the war, uh, uh, not even telling his wife what he was doing, uh, you know, as a um, But after the war, we were able to get a small uh, apartment uh, through my my and uncle in Paris. And so my brother and I were born there. And uh, when I was very little, we uh, came to the United States. We were able to get a visa from another aunt in the United States. And we moved to Queens in New York. Uh, my parents were both in camps in what is called Transnistria, uh, which is actually part of Ukraine now. Okay. It's uh, kind of current, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, they were sent on these uh, death marches where most people um, passed away uh, just transporting themselves from where these little towns where they lived in Romania. And uh, the, um, uh, the problem with what, what they did at that time is uh, they sent people basically to abandoned farms, like pig farms. Mm -hmm just left them there with guards around them who were in many cases collaborators from Romania uh, who were Nazi collaborators. And uh, the people there, any food or water or anything at all. And uh, as a result, most of them died of um, starvation, typhus, uh, the cold, the elements, the fact that you know, they were getting no medical care, et cetera. So um, my parents both lost uh, their parents um, and my mother lost her younger brother as well. Um, and my father um, was sent after the war actually to Siberia for a year when he was liberated by the Russians. So uh, it was a terrible experience that they went through uh, my mother had typhus, I think, three times. My father also had malaria and typhus and survived, you know, horrible fevers and uh, illnesses and starvation. Um, most of the people in the camps did perish from the cold and the, uh, and the sicknesses. Um, so when we came to the United States, it was my brother and I. We were very little. And growing up in New York, not speaking English as a first language mm. was a challenge. Um, I also felt like in many ways an outsider because I was European. And uh, you know, everybody else in the classes were American kids who were very um, you know, integrated into the school setting and yeah, of course. Uh, could communicate much better than I could. I remember once I had a substitute teacher that wanted me to do some kind of project uh, by the end of the day in class. And I didn't know the word for ruler. Um, I forgot the word ruler. And you needed to measure things to do this algebra um, math that was part of the assignment. And I raised my hand and I asked her if I could have a mark because I thought the word was mark, not ruler. And she looked at me and said, you're not supposed to use a marker in this grade. You do it without a marker, you know, and I had no idea how I could do it. Because <laughs> I, I thought that was the word for measuring the things that you yeah. have to do for the uh, assignment. 
<laughs> so it's just that kind of thing where you didn't have, uh, you know, English at the tip of your tongue at, at an early age that uh, led to some problems. But I did wind up succeeding very much in school, uh, you know, and going on to college and getting an MBA and everything. So, uh, <laughs> but I suppose you, you probably a bit, were a bit more driven as well because of of that obstacle early on in life where you had, you didn't have the language where you just kind of probably had to you probably felt you had to prove yourself a bit more uh, than, than others, which which stands to you, of course, because I mean you, uh, your English is perfect at the moment. So uh, so yeah, but th it's amazing though. Uh, that that your parents survived all that ordeal uh, they had to go through, uh, and wow, I mean uh, that's just something you, you don't hear that you actually don't hear that often. So, but how what kind of impact did that have on you um, growing up? The 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 experience that, you, that your parents had was I, I know myself I, I'm I was born way past the war, but. My parents, they they lived through the war, and my aunts and uncles. But there was always a bit of paranoia talking uh, about it. So I'm not sure was that was that a similar kind of thing with you as well? Or well, my mother was very open. About my yeah. Young age. I I always knew that I was the daughter of survivors. Um, my parents were religious at all. They uh, kind of I guess I. Don't, say that they turned their back on women, but they were not uh, going to synagogue uh, weekly or things like that, Or whereas they had come from families that were religious. Yeah. But I think that what they experienced made them really kind of doubt, you know, the existence of God and how it could happen and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, you know, consider myself Jewish culturally more than um, being very observant. Mm. Uh, and I respect people who are observant and I admire them very much because I feel like I would have so much to learn if I had to try and become religious at this stage. Um, I'm married now to a wonderful Jewish uh, physician and uh, we have a great relationship. We have a wonderful uh, connection to Judaism and we do attend and we do go, uh, you know, to the high holy services and things like that. But um, growing up, it was difficult to be uh, someone who always felt like uh, my parents were like helicopter. They call them helicopter parents now. Yeah. Being a child of a survivor. Uh, you know, is in another dimension of being a helicopter parent. Because <laughs> we're constantly worried about everything. And my mother still is a worrier at this point. She just turned a hundred. Wow. Totally wow. has all of her cognitive skills. Uh, is amazing, actually, for someone at her age. The only thing, she has a mobility issue. And, uh, you know, she has to be careful not to fall. Um, she just had a hip surgery uh, about two months ago. So okay. she's but she didn't require a hip replacement, just a surgery to stabilize her hip because she had fallen and it, you know, she had a minor fracture. Um, thank God it wasn't worse. Uh, but 100, 102, I mean, if, uh, I, I would sign up for that today, if, if I, <laughs> regardless <laughs> of uh, what state I would be in, I would sign off for that. But yeah, that that's 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 uh, no, that's that's I mean that's that's amazing. Um, but yeah, um, so but when your father he, he passed away a couple of years ago, am, am I right? Yeah. Yes, many years ago. In yeah. the 80s, he had a brain tumor and died, and I think it might have been from exposure to the when he was in Siberia, or I don't yeah. know like, what really contributed to it. But uh, he died when he was only sixty-two. Okay, so, that's that's young. He's been a widow for time. <laughs> yeah, but Haldun too—that's probably the best revenge she could give to uh, uh, that that orphan fella, uh, the small one with the mustache, I suppose. Uh, so yeah. And I have her sister, who was born in the United States. Uh, yeah. She's ten years younger than me, and uh, she's a physician. 
then, um, you know, we're in different parts of the country now. My brother's in New York, my brother's in Maine, and, uh, and I'm here in Florida now. Yeah, but it, you, you, you moved to Florida a couple of years ago. You, 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 you run a public relation, uh, um, public relations company, uh, atomic, um, public relations. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and how do you find that? Because I, I've seen some of uh, the client list and I see, that, for instance, L'Oreal USA is one of them. That's, that's quite a, a, a big, a big client to have, uh, on, on your books. So how is that working uh, for you? Well, very interesting. Um, that L'Oreal is when I was with Golan, which is a big PR company in New York. Yeah. Worked for many years before we moved to Florida. And, uh, and I do a lot of work with nonprofits. I do work with universities. I'm working with the Medical Women's Association, wonderful physicians, um, uh, spreading all kinds of health and women's uh, interest news using them as for the media. Um, I enjoy it very, very much. I, uh, I've worked with museums, I've worked with uh, nonprofits dedicated to fighting anti-Semitism. I do pro bono work for that specifically. And, uh, and my other clients include, uh, you know, startups, tech companies, um, uh, you know, I'm pretty much of a generalist. Yeah. So I work with the media, you know, in whatever field the uh, client is in. They could be a lawyer, they could be a psychiatrist, they could be, um, you know, a real estate person, um, whatever it is. And I find the media that would be interested in what they're doing. I'm working with a fashion designer now. So I'm pretty much all over the place in terms of clients. Um, and I enjoy that part of it very much because it's, you know, it's really uh, connected. I, I'm, yeah. someone who, I'm somewhat of a news junkie, so I know the news almost the second it yeah. happened. And I'm also very integrated into the community here. Um, and I basically serve as a conduit to a lot of breaking news to uh, some of the local government people that I know here. Um, so that they know what issues are, are going to be important for the people living here for quality of life. Yeah, but it sounds like a very versatile um, position uh, of approach. Yeah, but uh, did, of course, and we can't ignore the, the last couple of years we had this thing called COVID uh, and all the lockdowns. Did, did that have an impact uh, on, on, on your work? Well, actually, I work remotely as it is. Most of my clients are not here in Florida. They're in New York. They're in California. They're all over the place. So it didn't really change very much, uh, you know, in terms of what I was doing. It was kind of poor, uh, but uh, it didn't really impact uh, my career. Okay, uh, that, that, I suppose that's that's the benefit of, of working uh, remotely. Because actually, to me, <laughs> the whole COVID situation has been beneficial as well. Because before, I wouldn't be able to uh, uh, to do this. I mean, I, I've been I've been getting into the whole Zoom thing as well, and I've been uh, I've tried to get as many things on as well. But that wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to do that before. So that's that's a good thing as well. So, but you mentioned anti uh, your fight against anti-Semitism there. Um, of course, it's unfortunately it's it's quite prevalent again. Even though I, I believe it never really went away, it just kind of went dormant for uh, maybe for a decade or two. But um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 coming back to rear its uh, ugly head. So, uh, how you find that you get a lot of negative uh, approach for that? Because I I do uh, even because I write a lot about Holocaust and people say, well, would you ever give it a rest? Or if you even mention something about well, this is one of anti-Semitism, anti say no, it's not, and it's I even have received threats and everything. So. Uh, did you, uh, did you, do you get any negative uh, feedback or is mainly positive? Well, for me, it's, uh, it's mainly positive because uh, I believe in education as yeah. a most important thing. 
what you're doing is providing education and history, uh, which is unfortunately not being uh, provided in the schools. Yeah. Uh, something that we should never forget about. And I think that the only way to educate people um, to fight against prejudice is through education. So um, I believe that public relations plays a role in that as well as what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, it's very important. And as you said, unfortunately, history seems to be put on the back burner in, in, in many um, jurisdictions at the moment. Now, luckily, Ireland hasn't gone that way yet, even though there was talk of it uh, a few years ago, but the then Minister of Education said, no, no, this is going to stay in the curriculum. But uh, yeah, uh, I often say if, if you if you forget your history, you'll forfeit your future. Uh, and that's unfortunate. It's a truth. Um, but what kind of what kind of companies are you dealing with when it comes to fighting uh, anti-Semitism? It's, uh, it, if you yes. don't mind. Sure. I'm with the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, which is kind of a think tank. They're actually... Yeah. Uh, in England, um, and they try to inject or uh, incorporate the history and, um, uh, you know, lessons of the past in college curriculums around the world, fighting anti-Semitism, and they come out with white papers and studies about, uh, you know, the threats that are out there, um, and try to make sure that as many universities as possible uh, have uh, fighting anti-Semitism uh, courses uh, in terms of history courses um, in their curriculum. So that's, uh, that's one of my main um, interests. And the other one would be Next Generations, which is uh, uh, also a very educational um, organization of children of survivors. Um, I was involved in promoting their events and uh, publicity. So um, I think that it's very interesting, uh, you know, to, to constantly be aware of what's going on and, uh, you know, to work with organizations that are dealing with... Um, Anti-Semitism. Fighting, uh, well, fighting anti-Semitism, I suppose, yeah. But yeah, and I I I see a, a a link. I always see a link between anti-Semitism and racism uh, in general. There's often the groups that are quite racist. They also tend to be quite anti-Semitic. So, and I think, and you're right. Uh, the only way to fight this is is by education. But having said that. If you see some organizations, some uh, schools, for instance, some school, or some uh, educational institutions banning books because it doesn't suit their um, uh, curriculum or it, it might be a bit too close to the truth, I think that's the pity and that is the will to damage to, uh, to education as well because History is what it is. Uh, I mean, if you if you if you don't face it, if you don't want to learn from it, you, you'll never have to change any situation. So, uh, and that, and I think that's a pity. That again, if you see the banning of books, uh, and I, I know it was recently it was a case again in the states. Some some principal or some uh, education board had wanted to ban uh, Anne Frank's diary or, or a version yeah. of it, and I think. Yeah. <laughs> What's Nick. what's what's the point of of, of doing that? I mean, uh, there's no absolute has there has no point. There's no point. No, I think that uh, you know it's age appropriate uh, that you know, teachers at a certain grade level should definitely incorporate it into their teaching. Uh, you know, so that people know what what actually happened. You know, there are not going to be that many survivors left to go to schools and give their personal testimonies of what they endured. Um, and if you can't read books like uh, The Diary of Van Frank, how are students going to know that this ever happened? Uh, they are personal memoirs uh, of, of 
people who, who perished. Uh, and uh, I think we have to keep that going. We have to continue to support Holocaust museums. Uh, we should have students going to those museums to learn about what happened and to recognize the signs and the symptoms of what can happen when people turn against one particular religion. Yeah, exactly. And we, we, people seem to forget the Holocaust at, at the root of it. It was, it was a genocide. And there's, unfortunately, there's too many. Again, if, 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 even in recent history, it, it, happens, it happened again. And it's still happening at the moment, which is a pity. And that's because people don't want to learn or can, are not able to learn from, from history. And they want to kind of push it away in the corner or... This is a bit too dark for us. It doesn't suit us. It doesn't suit our narrative. So push it away, and you get nowhere with that. So, and I'm delighted that that you're working with these organizations uh, to to fight anti-Semitism, and and I, I, I'm intrigued by the, the the next generation because I know quite a few um, children of survivors, and they 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 seem to. Oh, not them themselves, but they, they seem to have the burden of their parents, uh, often survivor's guilt. Uh, did it ever play a part in, in, in your life? No, actually, you know, my parents, uh, my father, I would say, was more depressed throughout yeah. his life from what he had gone through. My mother is a very positive thinking human being, which is something that I admire so much about her. Uh, so, um, when it comes to um, attitude and thinking about the future, I think it's very important to recognize that you should be proud of your parents if they survived and it shouldn't be a burden. I mean, it's, it's uh, to me, it's always been, a, you know, something that I admire yeah. about uh, because they went through so much and they, and, you know, they, they proved, uh, Hitler wrong by having a family and, and uh, being very good parents and, uh, you know, creating a life for themselves in spite of what they had gone through. Yeah, exactly. And that's, as I said, that's the best revenge they, 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 they could give. Uh, but yet, I often, despite this might sound bizarre, but as you know, I do write a lot about Holocaust, but I often get accused for, um, well, not being Jewish. They, they tell me, well, you shouldn't be writing about the Holocaust. That's, uh, you're, 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 not, you're not Jewish. And I, I say, well, what's, what, what, what difference does it make if somebody <laughs> wants to tell the story or tell the, so to me, it makes no, so, so I, I feel myself in, in a position where I can look from it from a, an outsider view. So I probably can be a bit more objective, even though it's very hard to be objective. On, on, on these things, but uh, yeah, I, I find it sometimes bizarre that it's uh, um, that, I'm, that I'm being accused for not uh, being Jewish. And funny enough, it's never by, by Jews who does. It's usually others uh, uh, who, who, who accuse me for that. They say, "Well, you only want to make some kind of name for yourself." So yeah, I do. I want to make a name for myself because I want to educate people. I want to tell people what what happened and that we learn from this. So. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think it's, you know, important for people of all religions to, yeah. uh, to keep, uh, you know, the memory and the history alive. You know, and as a journalist, you can be any religion and you can be someone who makes an impact. You know, you, sp you have a big audience, you, uh, you educate people throughout the world. It's uh, impactful and it's a very powerful gift that you're giving everyone by doing what you do. Yeah, well, I, I don't consider myself a journalist. I, I, I suppose I, I, I don't even consider myself a historian. I just consider myself someone who wants to tell the things how I see it. Uh, so, but yeah. Uh, so going forward, what's do you have any... Great plans in, in the pipeline, which you want to talk about, or in your work in public relations, or other stuff. Because let's you hear no, let's promote your small business. 
Yeah. Me next week with the Jewish Museum in Miami Beach, which is going to be coming out with new programs and new exhibits. I actually had been a docent there a few years ago, and now I'm going to be meeting with their executive director about doing public relations for them. So I'm looking forward to that meeting. That, that sounds great. That sounds great. And sounds so great to me on Miami Beach. I mean, I, I wish I, I was there. I'm looking out our window now. It looks very, looks very great. We're going, probably going to have rain in the next hour or so. So how, how, I, how bad can it be? <laughs> I was in Ireland with my husband in July. Were I, you? I, oh, very we good. Went, yeah, we went to, uh, you know, uh, you know, Belfast and uh, we, we saw the uh, Titanic exhibit. Uh, it was Liverpool. It was beautiful. Yeah. So we had a great time, and um, we took a cruise actually uh, from London to uh, ending up in Ireland and leaving from there. So it was. It was. Well, I'm sorry I didn't know you before. I would have tried to well, be See, Belfast still a bit bit away from me. It's still <laughs> still a bit yeah. of a journey, but yeah. Okay. Oh, Dublin, yeah, yeah, there. yeah. yeah I, I would have made the effort to uh, to come up to me to, to say hello to you, but yeah, unfortunately, we, we only connected recently, and um, so yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it was great talking to you, uh, Charlotte, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna follow up on these things again because uh, you, your work your work is important, uh, uh, much more important than mine, uh, uh, by the way. So uh, keep that going as well. So thank thanks you. for that. It was a pleasure, really. Have a wonderful weekend. And, you know, we have Labor Day here in the States. Oh, yes. So we, have, yeah. we have a day off on Monday, so that'll be good. Enjoy <laughs> that. So Bye. thanks for that. So we'll talk to you soon. Terrific. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.